the telling of this truth, no matter how hard the truth is, must be told, must be, must become part of our large collective narrative in order for us as a nation to heal. Because there's no way for us to heal. There's no way for us to repair what race broke in the world until we understand our part in the breaking and repent of that. Hi, friends. I'm Amy Julia Becker, and this is Love is Stronger Than Fear, a podcast about pursuing hope and healing in the midst of personal pain and social division. Speaking of healing, and before I get to today's guest, I do want to let you know that my next book, which is all about the topic of personal and social healing, comes out soon on March 15th. It is called To Be Made Well, an invitation to wholeness, healing, and hope. You can pre-order it now, and if you are inclined to read this book and you are able to pre-order it now, that is a huge help uh, for me. It helps me just indicate to booksellers and to the public that people are interested in this topic and it gets promoted that way. So if you're going to pre-order it, if you're going to ever order it, do it now to be made well. Thank you. Um, Also, today I get to talk with Lisa Sharon Harper about her latest book, Fortune. And I will add that we do have a copy to give away, so check out the show notes for information on how to get a copy uh, and possibly win a copy for yourself. And before I tell you a little bit about our conversation, I will add that we discovered at the end of our interview that we both have double first names. So she goes by Lisa Sharon and I go by Amy Julia, but we called each other Lisa and Amy and did not realize it until the end. So despite that, we did have a great conversation I learned a lot about the particular laws and practices in various American colonies and states and the repercussions of those unjust laws, especially as it pertains to race, although also actually as it pertains to gender. I learned some things I hadn't learned before. I also learned more about the biblical concept of goodness and how it relates to a gospel of healing and repair. So I really appreciated that emphasis uh, that Lisa Sharon has on what it means for us to participate in the work of repair. I'm really grateful for this conversation, and I'm sure you will be too. Well, I am here today with Lisa Sharon Harper, and we are going to get to talk about all sorts of things, including her most recent book, Fortune, How Race Broke My Family and the World, and How to Repair It All. Lisa, Mm -hmm. welcome. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much, Amy. I'm excited to talk with you and be in conversation with your listeners. Mm. Well, so I want to start with your book, which is a book that's a combination of family history Mm -hmm. and also a commentary on race throughout American history. So there's a really particular lens and a very um, wide angle lens on these Mm -hmm. two histories that are really, you know, masterfully woven together in what you do. And then it's also a book that you write as a Christian who is calling for repentance and repair. So Mm -hmm. in, I I mean, I hope that's a fair characterization. That's at least what I saw as the big major strands of the book. And I'm curious to hear how you came to write it, both in terms of the decision to write it, but also the process. There had to be so much research. um, And there were, I, you even make note of this in the book, the emotion, not to mention the labor of just like figuring out your family's story. Could you just tell us about the decision to write it, the process of writing it, what that took for you and from you? Well, it's, it's really, I mean, it's written, but, but discovering family history is ongoing because for African-Americans, um, our, our lives were not documented and that was intentional. It was a decision that was made in the late 1600s, early 1700s, actually, uh, in Maryland and Virginia mm-hmm. in those first colonies um, and this included free people of African descent. Um, they just made a decision. People of African descent are not worth keeping tra- keeping records on, keeping mm-hmm. a track of. And uh, that was that was the actual logic that was presented um, to the legislature in Maryland when they made that decision, the colony of Maryland. Um, so because of that, um, and also because of the history of slavery, where in in enslavement, my ancestors were not that I can that I can find so far were not documented um, so well. All we have really are the family stories um, for that line of the family, Leah, Leah Ballard, um, the family stories and the census data that we see after enslavement, after mm-hmm. um, the abolition of slavery. So it was an incredible 
incredible, incredible um, journey. And I think, and thank God for DNA. Um, mm-hmm. Thank God for, for DNA science, because it's actually helped people of African descent all over the world, the diaspora, to make the connections back to our, our even our tribes, our nations yeah. on the continent, on the mother continent. So for me, when I got my AfricanAncestry.com kit back in the mail, or mm. you know the, the announcement of who I am back in the mail, I found out that my great, 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 great grandmother going, my mother's mother, mother's 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 mother, all the way back a thousand years was in Northern and Southern Nigeria. Hmm. Oh my God. Yeah. I I mean, I literally wept out loud Hmm. when I saw that because it was the first time in at least 365 years that we have been able to say, this is who we are. Right first time in centuries that my family line on that line has been able to say, this is who we are. And, and it's not just Nigeria, because that's a, that's a modern nation state back mm-hmm. then. And even now it's the people groups, the Hausa people who actually trace their lineage up through Iraq. They, they immigrated mm-hmm. from Iraq down into Northern Nigeria. And then, um, and then the Yoruba people, who are the people who have the griots and, um, and also very, very deep spirituality that we still hold with us um, on, in the diaspora. Mm-hmm. So I, I, this journey has been emotional. This journey has been 30 years in the making. Um, it, it increased with lightning speed when I joined ancestry.com and they did mm-hmm. not pay me to say that. It's just the truth. Yeah. Um, and, and it increased with lightning speed even more and continues to get honed and clarified through DNA matching on ancestry.com and Jed, Jed.com and things like that. So um, I still continue to find, um, find distant cousins and connections. And now that I've done all that research into the matches, you know, when you told me earlier, and before we rolled tape that yeah. your family has also been here since the 1600s. Mm-hmm. And so the minute I hear that, I go, okay, what's your, what's your surname? Because I have gone through all the roles. Like <laughs> I know, I know those original families, particularly in Virginia and um, in Maryland. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to place you like, okay, so where was your family in Virginia, right. Maryland? They weren't there. They were up in a in yeah, New England sure. area, area. So I actually don't, I'm not familiar with the New England um, uh, old families. Yeah. It's, you know, I, we were talking about this a little bit before we started here, too. It's just what I am thinking a lot about as you recount your story is also what I know about my family's story. And mm-hmm. that is the stories of also having on both sides, both my mother and father's side of the family, um, European white people who came in the 1600s to Massachusetts and Connecticut And while there have been people in my family who've moved to different parts of the country at various points, like here I am back in Connecticut, I was Mm -hmm. talking to my sister yesterday because there's a house in a town in Connecticut that's been in our family for, we don't know if it's 10 or 13 generations, but it's just been passed on and passed on and passed Mm -hmm. on. And so this sense of um, a family history that has been counted, right, that has been Mm -hmm. stable and there, you know, plenty of dysfunction. Mm -hmm. I don't mean to put any sort of rose colored glasses on what my family is, but more Mm -hmm. in terms of the institutional support for these people. And even to your point about the names, I have an uncle who did a lot of um, this type of research and he was coming back and telling us that we're the 10th cousin of such and such with a famous last name and we're the 12th cousin of the da da da. Mm -hmm. And my, um, my cousin, his daughter was like, dad, every white family that has been in this place since the 1600s is cousins with everyone else. Like this Wait. says nothing about us. Yeah, go ahead. Well, that is true of anybody, <laughs> black, white, Native American who can trace their lineage back to those hmm. original colonial eras on the, on the Eastern coast. I, I, one of the things that blew my mind was the very first night I jumped on Ancestry.com, no joke, at around 3.30, somewhere between 3 and 4 in the morning, I look up and I am in Jamestown. I'm like, what? How did, what? <laughs> like, yeah. nobody told me this. What are you talking about? Right. Jamestown? How could I go I mean, back that far? Yeah. I mean, and it's literally just from clicking the leads, right? All yeah. I did was just click the hints, click yeah. the hints, click the hints. And it, and it was not through direct lo- blood, although 
I'm sure on another line, it probably is because all of my mother's line, both sides of my mother's line kind of traces back that direction. Mm -hmm. But, um, but no, it was because of marriage, right? So they married um, into a family that goes directly back to some, and of course, if it's in Jamestown, then you can also trace way back in Europe. Um, Now on fortune's line, this is the thing. So you had that experience for yourself and your, your uncle, um, your uncle or your father, my uncle, your uncle. Right. So, so I'm doing the DNA in order to to find the matches, um, for those, for the fortune family. And, and also I I got curious at one point and I write about this actually in chapter one, got curious because I, I now know through court records, the families that indentured fortune and her family. No men are ever mentioned in any of these court records that are indenturing Fortune, her daughter, Sarah, and also her, Sarah's son, Humphrey, who we believe our lineage is through. No, no men. Only the women were indentured. And they were indentured because they bore illegitimate children in the, in the context of being indentured. Why were the men never prosecuted? Who were the men? Mm -hmm. And so when I went back and I found the DNA of those indenturing families in my matches, that's why. Right. Because the men were raping my ancestors. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's a lot. How do you hold that? Right. Well, and that's, I'm going to, on the first page of the book, I was um, so struck by this line. You write, I was terrified to unearth the story of my family. It mm-hmm. felt like I was about to push into the heart of American evil. And so mm-hmm. I'm curious for you about that experience, the courage it took, um, and whether it did, as you went through it, feel like more and more of pushing into the heart of American evil. Mm-hmm. I really was terrified I, 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 for, for a couple of reasons. One, American evil right now, um, because Southern Maryland and this, this, the Eastern Shore of Maryland um, is known actually to have lots of hate groups. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the South. I mean, yeah. it is the actual South and people there who are sympathizers with the Confederacy are, you know, they're no joke. They're real. So here I was black woman going to go by myself in a rental car down to mm-hmm. um, Southern Maryland and be in a, in a, you know, Airbnb for about a week and um, or several days and do this research all on my own, go to these backwoods places. So I was a little bit nervous. I was like, you know, you know, who, what's going to happen to me today? Yeah. But I was also nervous because there were so many questions and I didn't know what I was going to find. <sighs> and I was, I don't know exactly what I was afraid of, except I don't like gore. I don't like blood and guts. My mom loves those kind of movies. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not into it. I'm really not. I'm more of an epic romance kind of girl, you know? And so I, I had no, I had no idea what I would find. And especially because colonial history is, was even more of a mystery to us than antebellum history. We just, we don't know, yeah. and, but I had heard some really heinous things. And I also didn't know if I was going to find anything. I was surprised when I got there to find game road right. and also to go to the courthouse and find the, the deed, the actual deed to property that Betty Game, Fortune's daughter, owned. Um, she owned property. Right. Um, in 1756, she signed for that property and lived on that property with Fortune, actually. And Fortune ended up moving back in with her at some point. And Betty Game refused to pay the black tax. So I think I was surprised when I went down there to find the power of right. my, of my people. Like they had really rallied and they, they had, they fought off the white um, nationalism that was really bearing down on them throughout the early 1700s. And I found that, you know, by the time you get to the revolution, the race relations in Maryland had gotten to a, a fever pitch and actually the black community, because the black community there had grown to outnumber the people of European descent, because there were so many slaves. Remember, Maryland is, is, the, is the, the colony that enslaved, um, that it, well, it wasn't a colony then, but the state that enslaved Frederick Douglass and Harry Tubman, sure. right? So this is that place, but this is in the colonial era, but they had had 
so many people of African descent that they started to really be heinous in their race laws. And so my, by this time, three African American um, uh, ancestors, they were not able to actually live free. So they escaped over the river into Delaware, into a little enclave that was of of free black um, people in Southern Delaware who kind of carved out a space for them to be able to live free. But all of that gives me a sense of what it might've been like. And why is this important? Why is this important now? It's important now because what my ancestors went through gives us a window into what actually happened here. Mm -hmm. And to um, not just, oh, isn't that interesting, right? But rather, this is part of our history. Part of our history is that race relations um, developed through these laws that um, it changed over the course of basically a century, that race laws changed over the course of a century. And by the time of the Revolutionary War, they were, they were hardened. And after the Revolutionary War, when we became a nation, they, didn't, they had another choice. They could have said, we're not doing this anymore. But instead, they entrenched it. Right. They made a decision to entrench it. Um, and at the same time that they entrenched slavery, it, it's noteworthy. They also entrenched patriarchy. Hello. So at the same time that they entrenched slavery, women who were able to vote in the colonies had their right to Hmm. vote stripped of them at the exact same moment in history. So it wasn't just, you know, about whiteness. It was about white men Hmm. having all power. Um, And that's why you have the suffrage movement rise up about a half a century later and have to fight for vote, not because they had never been able to vote, but because when America became a nation, a nation the vote was stripped from, from them. So that, like all of this research unearthed that. And that tells us more about the moment we're in because the moment we're in is just a continuation of this centuries long struggle that white men have unleashed on this soil. Not all white men, but white men have done this to secure the supremacy of whiteness. And it's not just Europeanness. It is, it has become whiteness. Um, whiteness as a racial construct was created to do one thing, to determine who was called by God and has the capacity and has the right to rule mm. on this land. Yeah, and you do a great job, I think, of showing that link between, there's a point, I didn't write this down, but where you're talking about, this is not about hatred, it's about power. And let's not confuse that, because I think we can Mm -hmm. almost think, well, I don't see that strong emotion. I don't see that even some of the the laws might, they might uh, work themselves out by way of violence, but they might Mm -hmm. often not call for the violence, right? And so you can say, well, wait. Oh, no, 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 no. they do call for it. They do call for the violence, but it's not out of hate. It's out of a need to control. Right, right. So there's like a sanitized, um, I don't know, almost facade or something going on. And it meets itself out with violence and with trauma and with separation and with these hierarchies. Uh, But if we think of this in like emotional um, terms Mm -hmm. and not in these more power and legal terms, I think it can be confusing actually, if we Mm -hmm. try to understand what the history is telling us. And I think you do a good job of just noting where and how that's happening throughout our history and, and some of those effects now. And I'm curious, one of the other things that, so you write about evil, but you also write about goodness and your previous book, the very good gospel, right? Has mm-hmm. goodness in the title. Mm-hmm. And there's this point in fortune where you uh, are writing about the difference between a Greek an ancient Greek idea of goodness as perfection mm-hmm. and a biblical idea of goodness as goodness in relationship. And I would love yeah. to hear you talk about the ways in which the concept of goodness really matters as we think about um, moving from this history towards something that, um, a pro- you know, is about healing and repair. Yes, exactly. And actually, I'll go back to one of your original questions to ask when you asked, what made you write this? Mm. Um, what made me write this was it really is a natural extension of the very good gospel. Mm. The very good gospel actually starts with Leah, 
it starts with my family story because that's what made me realize, boy, you know, I couldn't go up to Leah Ballard, my last, my third time's great grandmother and, and, and who we believe was, she was enslaved in South Carolina. We believe was what they called a breeder. Um, they, they forced her to quote, breed money for her master. Right. I couldn't go up to her and say, um, God has a wonderful plan for your life. (laughs) but you are sinful and therefore separated from God. Right. Like I couldn't, I couldn't go up to her and and expect her to jump and shout and call that good news that Jesus has died to pay the penalty for your sin. And if you you pray this little prayer at the back of the gold booklet, you get to go to heaven. Like I couldn't, I couldn't, when I realized I could not say that to her, it actually, it it tanked me for a year. I was depressed Mm. because my, you know, as, as somebody um, who, who really does believe the scripture, um, the gospel was the center of my worldview. So if now my gospel doesn't make sense. What, what, what's, which way is up, which way is down. Yeah. And so, you know, the very good gospel was me working that out mm-hmm. and working out the reality that I did discover. And I didn't make the discovery obviously, but I found this truth passed down to me by rabbinical scholars that I was in conversation with that Tob, um, the, the Hebrew word for goodness that you find in the first page of the Bible in Genesis one, it doesn't mean the original writers and hearers of that, of that word would never have said that this word means the thing is good. The thing itself is perfect because goodness for the Hebrews did not exist inside the thing. So when God looked around at the end of the sixth day and said, this is very good, God would not have been saying, that's a really good walrus I just made, or that's a great little human being I just made, right? No. What God would have been saying is because Tove lives between things, mm-hmm. God would have been saying all the relationships within my creation are Tove me owed, very good. Mm-hmm. Um, and that very means radically good, right? So, so that's about ethics. It's about how we treat each other. It's about how we live together in the world. And, and it also makes, um, it's important to note that this text was written in the context of people who were um, coming out of being enslaved. Whether you think the text was written by Moses or you think the text was written by the priests who were coming out of Babylonian exile. In both cases, they were coming out of slavery. Moses, a few hundred years. Um, Babylonian exile, 70 years of enslavement. And in both cases, the people, they were told by their enslavers, you are nobody. Right. You are nobody. You don't have the right to exercise dominion. You don't, you, in fact, you were created to be enslaved. And, but that, by the way, ends up coming right down, right. I mean, is passed down through the civilizations. till you get to Aristotle and Aristotle says, if you are a conquered people, you have demonstrated you were created to be enslaved. So he ain't saying nothing new. He didn't invent that thought. He got that actually from the Babylonians who already thought that as well. So, so when we get to, um, when, when I was doing uh, the work to figure out now, what are the implications? If this is true, that the way that God sees goodness, the way that God actually um, will, will be caused to celebrate something as very good um, is that if the relatedness between things is very good, if the relationships, then God cares most, not about my perfection, my perfection is not even in the text. It's not something God cares about in the text. Rather, God cares about our ethics. God cares about how we maintain and build good, radically interdependent, beautiful relationships with each other, between humanity and the earth, within ourselves, between us and the systems that govern us, because these are all the relationships that were created on the first page of the Bible. And that's what God says is good, having these relationships well. So, you know, the very good gospel looks at all these relationships and asks the question, how did we break it and how can we make it better? So the natural, the next step is to go deeper and ask the question, how was it broken in my family and how can we fix it? But as I did that research, it struck me, especially when I discovered fortune and how fortune, earliest ancestor, her body absorbed the wrath of those very first race laws. And that impacted her 
and her descendants for generations, really the course of our family's life. That line of the family's life was determined by that, by that set of laws that came rolling for about 50 years out of, um, out of Virginia and, and Maryland. Um, and, and it benefited them actually to some degree. It, it enslaved them uh, through the indenture um, system, but indenture means you have a time limit on your slavery. Yeah. And so that was the heinous part of it. The women were raped serially, likely. Right. Um, the men in the family uh, were, were enslaved and likely raped as well. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Um, but, and they were all separated from each other because indenture, if a family moves, you know, and, and your, your mom is free, which was the case for Sarah, um, she was free by the time her children were then moved into, Mar- into Virginia, we believe, by their masters. And so they were separated forever, um, right across the river. Right. And so that was the cost, right? But because Maudlin was white, this is where you see in those very first race laws, because Maudlin was white, Fortune's mother was white. Fortune could not be enslaved. She could only be indentured. Mm-hmm. 31 years um, if her father was black, for 21 years if her father was white. And mm-hmm. so again, the privilege of whiteness. Right. So we see right. that the privilege of whiteness baked into those original race laws. And, and it Im- impacted that line of the family um, in two major ways. One, we had that experience of um, the black tax, of the oppression that those original laws meant to levy on people of African descent, the control, the confinement, um, the lack of documentation. And we also gained the benefit, um, the, the privilege of our white lineage through, um, through Maudlin. And because of that, by 1756, all of them are free. Right. They all are la- landowners. And actually, Sarah's, Sarah's son, Humphrey, um, who we believe is, is my direct ancestor, he had, and he enslaved people. Now, we don't know if his enslaved people were family members that he was just trying to keep from being sold um, by somebody else or, or bought by somebody else, or if he was actually owning, owning people. Um, so hmm. that, this, this is that heritage. And it's one, it's one that, that informs us a lot for what's happening right now. Well, and so here's, I'm backing up a little bit in what you just said, because I'm thinking about that shift in understanding of the gospel that, you Mm -hmm. know, you began with in the very good gospel in terms of um, this kind of individual, very simple story that has to do with you as an individual and God as an individual, essentially, and Mm -hmm. what's going to make that better. And I'm curious, as you think about this goodness and repair, um, and the weight of evil and trauma in individual and collective and generational stories, like where, how do you see Jesus, both in terms of Mm -hmm. life, death, resurrection, like the whole story of Jesus fitting Mm -hmm. in to this picture now? Yeah, that's a really great question. It's very simple, actually. On that first page of the Bible, Humanity is given dominion, given the ability to exercise rada, right? So rada is the Hebrew word for dominion. And rada literally means um, to, uh, to tread down. Now you would think, I could see how somebody would get it twisted and think that that means oppress. It doesn't. <laughs> it's in the context of the, the very beginning, like when vegetation is right. going up all over the place. And, you know, it's basically, it means to steward the right relationships, the, the, the overwhelmingly good, well relationships between all things, not let everything go all crazy. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's really about stewardship. It's about um, a good picture of Radha is found in Genesis 2. Um, in Genesis two, you see God place the human in the garden and say, till and keep it. And those words till and keep actually translate serve and protect. So mm-hmm. Radha looks like service. It looks like protection of the relatedness and relationships. And so 
when you, um, when you, when you roll forward, um, what you find is that Radha then becomes domination after the fall. Mm -hmm. And when you roll forward from there, Jesus, I believe was, it's not just domination of, you know, people or plants or whatever. It's domination of the image of God. Mm -hmm. Because on that first page of the Bible, as the ancients heard them say, and let us make humankind in our image, in our likeness, what they would have heard is they would have heard, this is the king making the images of the king inside the king's domain, earth. And then he says, multiply and fill the earth. Well, why do you think he did that? Because that means wherever the king's image is, is where that king rules. Now catch this, wherever the king's images were flourishing, where there were many of of the king's images, you knew that kingdom was flourishing. But where you saw the king's image was crushed or melted down or twisted Mm -hmm. or covered over, then you knew there was war against the king happening in that kingdom. Mm -hmm. So now what I would say is that King Jesus, that Jesus came as the king of the kingdom of God Mm -hmm. to set the image of God free from the, the kingdom, the kingdoms, rather the little, little empires of men that were hell bent on crushing and twisting and toppling and covering over and erasing the image of God from earth Mm -hmm. through genocide, through poverty, through exploitation. Well, and ironically, right, also through self-destruction, because to the degree that any of us are hell-bent on destroying the image of God, we are also hell-bent on destroying ourselves. And I've been, um, I don't know, I I guess I was struck actually this past um, Christmas season by uh, in the Magnificat, when Mary says, my soul magnifies the Lord, um, my soul glorifies God, my Savior. And I was thinking about uh, the idea of what it means to bring God glory and how yeah. for so long I've thought about glory as just like being in a worship service and saying, you know, <laughs> God, glory. we glorify you, which is great, fine. But just that sense of glory as magnification of who God is, right, of making God more clear and more um, large And if God is in us, like if we are the representatives of the image of God, then to the degree that we are reflecting who God is, to the degree that we are magnifying God's goodness, beauty, truth in the world and in our lives, we are glorifying God. And so it's a different, that sense of what you're talking about as Jesus, as the embodied image of God and us being invited to also embody the image of God, right? It's like... That is what brings God to glory is as we are more and more true to who God has made us to be. Is that- I, I think that, let me say, I, I track with you and I would, I would actually come at that slightly different because of the work in Genesis 1. I don't think, I think that every single person, we're not invited, we're not invited to, to bear the image of God. We are born with the image of God. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Born with it, right? But see, that's the language of our churches. Some of our Western churches in particular, and in particular evangelical churches, we get it twisted. We, we, we conflate two things. We conflate those who were Christian in Acts, called Christian because they were like Jesus, right? So we say we want our, our goal is to become more like Jesus. And then we conflate that with become more in the image of God. But those are two different things things in terms of the text, two different texts Mm -hmm. talking about two different things. We really need to not conflate them because what that does, what it has done is that when we say that we need to, sorry, when we say that we are invited to be um, more in the image of God, what we're actually saying is we are invited to be more human. And that, that is where we get genocide that's where the logic of genocide and enslavement comes from. It comes from the logic that these are not full humans until they look like me, mm-hmm, until right, they believe right. as I do, right? And that, so that's where the prayer towns came from up in your area. Um, that's where Jonathan Winthrop had the great idea of the Pequot massacre 
Mm. Um, and then the prayer towns that force Native Americans to to be Christian, basically, in order to become more human. Right, right, right. And and where we also, I mean, just on from the disability perspective too, yes, can measure yes. humanity based on all sorts of criteria rather than the simple fact of being human and that every human bears the image of God. I think what I'm thinking of is the ways in which we nevertheless live in ways that distort that image. So it's essentially an invitation to live into who you already are. Um, Like that's how I've thought about it and to participate in the truth of how God has made you. um, Yeah. You know, that I, I just read an article in the New York times about a, um, Albert Durer, I think that's the name of the, it's a Renaissance artist. There was a sketch that um, somebody bought at a tag sale for $30 and they think they're going to be able to sell it for, you know, tens of millions. Mm -hmm. And just that sense of like not recognizing the value of what you have and Mm -hmm. it being put in a drawer, passed down from tag sale to tag sale and how we do that with our own lives. Right. And like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh, you're of inestimable worth. Like that is who you are. Yes. Um, And so, so I think, yeah, it's good, good to point out. Yeah, go ahead. Now, Amy, Imagine, imagine applying that truth to Leah Ballard. Right. Imagine applying that truth to Fortune. Imagine applying that truth to Willa, right? To Willa, my grandmother, um, who was forced by law in South Carolina to work as a domestic because after the end of the Reconstruction, they passed laws that people of African descent could only work in two industries. One, domestic service to farm work. Right. So when she was a child, she had to earn her keep in South Carolina by picking cotton or doing whatever it was on their plantation. And they, they're not a plantation, but on their land that Leah Ballard somehow had, she somehow inherited land or, or bought land. But um, she, my, my grandmother had to earn her keep by, by picking cotton down there. And that was only because that was the only thing she could do. She right. couldn't dream. She couldn't see this woman could sing. This woman was an artist. She could write amazing poetry. Mm. We found her poetry after her death. She was an artist, but in that construct, the laws and the systems and the constructs there covered over the image of God in her. Right. Did not allow her full humanity to flourish. Likewise with my mom, the same thing in the North in Philadelphia her books that she received in school were hand-me-down books, two generations old, three generations old from the white school, two blocks away, right? That she, wasn't, she was told she was out of district for, it was two blocks from her home. Her next door neighbor who was white went to that white school, right? But she had to go to the black school that got the hand-me-down books and the unqualified teachers. And so that's what I'm talking about. So yeah. yes, we all have to live into, into the image of God. But I think that what if when I look at Jesus, I see Jesus not just saying, okay, live into all of who you are. I see Jesus saying, lift oppressive systems from my image on earth mm-hmm. that is keeping them from flourishing. Right. Like my way of putting that can still be emphasizing the individual actualization rather than the participation in injustice and recognizing the ways in which. um, So there's a mutuality that I lose out on when all I'm focusing on is what does it mean for me to become my true self in Jesus? Right. Yeah. And and in fact, it's still going to be a distorted self, uh, you know, Mm -hmm. Unless I recognize that we are, you know, to use Dr. King's phrase, like tied up in a mutual destiny, right? Like this is all yes. interrelated. And so I guess as we come to the end of our time, I want to close with some questions about healing and repair, mm-hmm. because this is a narrative, your book, of generational mm-hmm. trauma and of the disintegration that happens in lives and in communities as a result of ex- all of these things we've been talking about. Mm-hmm. And yet you are also writing and you use a lot, especially towards the end, but the language of healing and repair. Mm-hmm. And so I'd love to hear from you. You can take this wherever you want, but 
um, both on a personal level or on a kind of collective level, speaking to those who want to be a part of the work of repair. Uh, where mm. did this book lead you? What does healing look like? What does repair look like? What do you have to say mm-hmm. to us on that? Well, that, thank you so much for that. The last part of the book is three essays on what repair will require. And it starts with truth telling. And I think that as we sit in, in this world today, um, we are in a world that does not honor truth. We're in a world where our politicians, the ones who are crafting the policies that will impact the image of God in, in corners of every corner of our nation, where they are not truth tellers. And by strategy, they're actually strategizing to keep power by telling lies. So we have to demand truth from our leaders Mm. and we have to, and we have to begin to search for the truth ourselves and not depend on them for the story. So I, I advocate, um, uh, researching your own family story because it can start there. You can find your truth by finding your family story. And let me tell you, as people of African descent, there are, and other, other um, people of color in America, there are, there's more information about us now online than there ever has been because of the development of platforms like Ancestry.com and 23andMe and mm-hmm. you know, MyHeritage and all of those. Um, so you can find a lot. And when you hit that, that wall of enslavement, then you can jump to DNA and, and begin to connect some dots. For people of European descent, Um, What this will require is it will require humility, the humility to say, I don't know it all and courage to say, God will be with me just as I did when I went down to um, the Eastern shore of Maryland, God will be with me in whatever I find. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the telling of this truth, no matter how hard the truth is, must be told, must be, must become part of our large collective narrative in order for us as a nation to heal, Hmm. because there's no way for us to heal. There's no way for us to repair what race broke in the world until we understand our part in the breaking and repent of that. So part of what repentance will look like in order to repair, in order to heal, is it will look like um, reparation. It look like restitution. And it will look like asking the impacted communities, what now, how do you say We need to act in order for things to be made well with you. Mm. That's what David says when the Gibeonites come to him and say, um, you know, Mr. David, Saul tried to um, annihilate us, commit genocide against us. And David had just been asking God, why is there a drought in the land? God, I don't know where there's a drought. And then it's like, knock on the door, Gibeonites. And he says he could have done a couple of things. He could have said, I'm so sorry for you and sent them on their way, which is exactly what people of, I mean, what America, the United States of America has done. For people, two people of African descent on this land, we have never, it's the only group in American history that has never had any level of reparations for the oppression that we experienced here. So um, David could have done that, but he didn't. He could have said, you know what? I'm so sorry for you. Hold on. I'm going to get my counsel together and we'll figure this out. But he didn't do that because the break happened at the moment when Saul saw himself as God, as the one to determine the day of these people's deaths, Mm -hmm. the one to determine whether or not these are full human beings. And they have, they have the call of God to exercise dominion over their own lives and their own families and their own land. Right? So the repentance has to include the bowing to the image of God and the other. So David's process was to ask them, what do you say? And then to do it Mm. without one question. And how does God respond to that? God lifts the drought. God lifts the drought right there. God lifts the drought. So what would that look like for us? It would look like listening to um, the African-American community, which over decades has been saying, this is what it needs. This is what needs to happen in order for things to be made well with us. Um, after the centuries of oppression that we have experienced here, we need to read the Black Manifesto. We need to pass HR 40. We need to pass the um, Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation Act um, that was put forward by uh, by Barbara Lee. A call for a Truth Commission. Yeah. Um, 
And, and we also need to, to read the vision of the Movement for Black Lives, um, which is an amazing vision that it parallels the vision of the kingdom of God. Um, and then finally, we need to heal. And we, people of African descent, people who have been impacted by this oppression, we will never fully heal if we are not able to release that which cannot be repaired that which can never be restored, the people who died, the communities who were broken up, um, that were broken up by eminent domain and by gentrification. There's, it's not coming back. And so we need to release that and then turn to God and say, okay, God, I still have the need. So now it's your turn to ante up. And people of European descent need to allow themselves to be released, to be forgiven to be let go of, to let the tide be cut and find now in a new way for yourselves to interact with the rest of the world, not in a way that elevates you on a scaffolding of your own making, but rather in a way that joins hands with the rest of the community of humanity on equal playing field and says to all of us, let's do this together. Hmm. Well, I think that is a great place to end this conversation. Let's do this together. And yet, to your point, um, let's recognize the ways in which um, forgiveness and release to self, to others, and ultimately in all of this, um, a recognition of who God is, uh, that God is God. uh, I mean, that's a very simple statement and yet seems um, to be embedded in what you just the vision you just cast is that unless Mm -hmm. we can recognize that God is God uh, both in terms of our own humility before God and one another and in Mm -hmm. terms of our own understanding of our authority uh, that God has given to us and our connections Mm -hmm. all of those things um, Mm -hmm. that until and and unless we are able to recognize that there will be ongoing struggle um, and pain, but there's a possibility for healing and repair, um, Mm -hmm. as we tell the truth. And then, as you said, like respond to that truth with healing action, um, and politically and personally. Right. Yes. Amen. Um, Well, thank you so much for your time today and for writing this book. I I mean, there's so I have like all these questions I didn't even have a chance (laughs) to ask you. So I'm just going to say that is a good sign of a good interview and also of just, um, my, I, I, to anyone's listening, I want to say if this was even in uh, remotely interesting to you, you should buy this book and think about, uh, all of these different stories and how they do relate to these ideas, because I think they're so important for all of us to be wrestling with. Mm. Thank you so much, Amy. It's great to have you. Thanks so much for listening to Love is Stronger Than Fear. Remember, again, check out the show notes to find out how you can win a copy of Fortune. And just a reminder, you can now pre-order To Be Made Well, my book. And I would love for you also, just as always, to share this episode, subscribe to this podcast, give it a quick rating or review wherever you find your podcasts, and that way more people can benefit from these conversations. Thank you, Jake Hansen, for your editing work. Thank you, Amber Media. Amber Media. I should call her Amber Media because she is my social media coordinator who does everything to make things happen. But her name is actually Amber Beery. So we're going to say thank you to Amber Beery. And thank you to you for being a listener. As you go into your day today, I hope you will carry with you the peace that comes from believing that love is stronger than fear. Mm-hmm.